Well, that's it. It is time for the Sunday Sermon. And whatever you're doing, wherever you are, busy, unbusy, stop. Listen in. This is a serious announcement about something, frankly, you may not have thought about. About some nebulous global institution called the World Health Organization. And who controls Britain? We've talked before about who runs Britain. Is it elected uh, MPs and ministers? Or is it the civil servants who got rid of Dominic Raab and are trying to get rid of the Home Secretary as we speak? We had a referendum to get back control of our sovereignty from Brussels, for heaven's sake. Years of angst and debate and fury and marches and heaven knows what. We got back our sovereignty, but now civil servants and ministers seem quite happy to abandon critical parts of our decision-making, our health care, to this global, unelected entity called the World Health Organization. In the third hour, I've got one of the absolute global experts from Texas, Dr. David Bell, to talk about this. But let's just start at the basics. What is the World Health Organization? Well, it's based in Switzerland, and every country in the world has, a, has the same vote. The UK is about the second or third largest funder of this organisation. And in theory, you've got all these members with one member, one vote. But in reality, this organisation is heavily influenced. And indeed, the current Director General, Dr Tedros, he has close links to the Chinese Communist Party. And there's also serious question marks about the funding, because up to 80% of its funding is now provided by either private interests, commercial interests, supposedly uh, philanthropic interests, but with an agenda. Oh, and some bloke called Bill Gates is apparently their second largest funder. Bill Gates Foundation gives about 10% of their funding. And that's all very well, you might say. But let's just remember that sometimes groupthink doesn't get it right. Most governments around the world messed up the COVID response with a few honourable exceptions like Sweden, like states like Florida, because that group think, they, they had that consensus thinking of scientists. And it was really hard to actually challenge that consensus thinking. So under the latest proposals, there are two elements to this. So that there's a thing called the World Health Organization's Pandemic Treaty. And then alongside that, there's the much more dangerous things called the amendments to the international health regulations. I know it's a bit, it's a bit stodgy for a Sunday morning, but this is serious because if these plans proceed as currently set out, and most of our MPs have no idea about any of this, then future decisions on lockdowns, on vaccinations, on passports, on school closures, on border closures, on quarantines, most of this will be decided by the order of the World Health Organization, and we would have to comply. And we would have to potentially give up to 5% of our annual health budget in a future considered health emergency or pandemic. That's about nine billion quid of your and my taxpayers' cash a year, with no ability to say no. Now, in my view, the World Health Organization cannot be trusted. This is the organization that, frankly, has a track record of giving some pretty dodgy advice. First of all, they said, don't wear masks. And then they said, do wear masks. When actually all the scientific evidence now shows there's no statistical difference about mask wearing. This is the World Health Organization. Their advice changed. They accepted the Chinese version as to the origin of COVID, that it came from the wet markets, even after they'd sent an inquiry team, when actually the, the reality is the suspicions grow and it's been very, very heavily suggested that actually the origin of COVID was from a Wuhan laboratory. But the WHO can't bring itself to say what everybody else is saying, including federal US government agencies. This is the same organisation as I said, that's heavily influenced by uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Recently, they've employed uh, a lady, a British 
professor called Susan Mickey. You may remember her. She was a member of the SAGE group. She's not actually a scientist. She's a professor of health psychology and behavioural change. She's also a member of a thing called the Communist Party of Britain. And just listen to this lady, this professor. I think we've got a video, hopefully Aaron can play now, of this professor. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I'll keep talking. It may come up. No, it looks like, uh, who knows, um, something may have been... That is the behaviour of social distancing, of when you're indoors, making sure there's good ventilation or if it's not wearing face masks and hand and surface hygiene. We'll need to keep these going in the long term and that will be good not only for COVID. So there we are. The WHO has employed to be the chair of their technical advisory group, a professor who's not a scientist who thinks that we should socially distance indoors as well as outdoors and wear masks forever. Seriously? And this is an organisation that may have the ability to order us what to do, to lock down, to close our borders, with someone with that sort of hopeless, useless advice. Unbelievable, there's nothing we can do. If two thirds of the member states vote for this change next May, there's nothing we can do. Now, the Foreign Office Minister, Andrew Mitchell, who was invited on this show to explain the government's position, but declined, says that the UK supports this treaty. The Conservative government support this treaty, but will not compromise our decision-making or sovereignty. If you'll forgive me for a moment whilst I absolutely puke and vomit. That man cannot be trusted in the same way the Tories could not be trusted on immigration when they said on multiple occasions, we're going to bring the numbers down in manifesto after manifesto after manifesto. Like the lies of Rishi Sunak that I outlined last week. I don't think Andrew Mitchell understands the treaty and the link to the international health regulations. Or if he does, he's deliberately misleading us because the two go hand in hand. And what people are doing is focusing on the treaty and says it's not binding, it's advisory. But they're not telling you that the international health regulation amendments will be binding and we will have to comply and there's nothing we would be able to do about it. It also demands the surrender of our technical know-how and intellectual property. This is, I mean, this is seriously extraordinary stuff that's, being, that's going through almost on the nod. I've got two MPs on in the next hour. I'm going to ask them their understanding of what's going on. Frankly, democracy means nothing at all if you're going to hand that sort of level of power, of our money, and potentially the implications for our lifestyles to a global, unelected, elitist body that's heavily influenced by people with communist instincts, heavily influenced by private funding, the vested interests of private funding. And we know about communists, don't we? Because their pattern of behaviour is they actually like to take control from us, even though we battled away and we voted and we voted and we had a referendum to get back control. Albeit the Tories have then blown any use of it. Do you remember there was a famous lady once who ran this show in the 1980s? She once said, no, no, no. And I tell you what, that is exactly what we should say about these proposed changes to the International Health Regulation Amendments and the proposed pandemic treaty by this thing called the World Health Organization. I hope you're still with me. We currently spend some 85 million quid a year on this thing. Voluntarily, thanks Boris, we gave them 100 million quid during COVID, we were the biggest voluntary contributor. That's your cash, by the way, that Boris just lobbed away to this body based in Geneva. Now, Professor Carol Sikora, well known to this great station, he wrote an article in the Daily Telegraph yesterday. He used to work for a couple of years at the World Health Organization. He wrote about the grotesque waste, the limousines, the chauffeur driven cars, the excess. He should know as having worked there. 
I've got a professor on later in the show, in the third hour of the show. He knows about this stuff. I don't want our hard-earned cash, when we're short of cash, going to these bodies. But here's the thing. We potentially cannot stop this treaty going through. It doesn't require a vote in the House of Commons for the treaty or indeed for the amendments to the international health regulations because if, as I say, more than 50% of the member states in Geneva vote this thing, then it goes through for the health regulations. What I say to you is if this thing is passed and it's binding on us as currently laid out, then we must have no choice but to withdraw from the World Health Organization. Now, the Wallies in Westminster will say that I've gone a bit extreme. But let's just remember, a certain president of the United States, Donald Trump, he withdrew from the World Health Organization in July 2020 because he was concerned about this and he was criticized by the consensus of the global elite. But I think given what we now know, Perhaps he was right after all. Sure, of course, let's have international cooperation, let's have committees, let's share advice and knowledge and technical know-how when it suits. But that's on a voluntary basis, on a cost-effective basis. It's called international cooperation. If it's an international organisation that takes huge quantities of power and can force us to do things and take large quantities of our cash, then I say that is way beyond the remit. That is a massive surrender of our sovereignty. We shouldn't allow it. What can you do about it, you say? Apart from give up, don't give up, never give up. As another famous politician once said, never surrender. I say, write to your MP, demand that we vote against this treaty in Geneva. And that if it is binding, then demand that we withdraw from the World Health Organization. Because this is completely unacceptable. And with that, here endeth my Sunday sermon.